see you. Hey, Bill. Okay. Thanks Good to see you again. again. Bill Schmarzo is, uh, we're here at the Cube. Bill Schmarzo, the Cube alumni is at EMC. I forget your title, but you're like a chief consulting, engineering, con services manager. Just keep talking, just I like it. What, I, like what, going, I mean, yeah. you know, chief something. <laughs> yeah, but tell us, you know, yeah. you're, you're, I mean, you, you go out and do all the engineering with top clients, uh, these big enterprises, service providers. You come in essentially to kind of clean up the architecture, show them the future around big data. And so you see a lot of projects out there in the marketplace. Yes, so, yes. so tell us one, what's the state of your current job situation? Um, how's the title of morphing? What are you working <laughs> on? Um, Oracle announcing a big data appliance. Spill, yeah, your, spill your guts. Yeah, welcome to the water, uh, Oracle. <laughs> Jump on in. The water is nice and cold. <laughs> So I am the, the Chief Technology Officer for the Enterprise Information Management Service Line. And in the area of big data, what, what we're seeing a lot is that customers are interested but confused. Right? First off, they don't know what big data means. I mean, the, the first blush is, ah, oh, that's about volume of data, right? And so they think about, you know, I, well, I don't deal with a petabyte of data, I only have a couple of terabytes. And so there's kind of a, um, an education process that we go through to help customers understand. When we say big data, what do we, what do we mean by that? And then the second area of the business, which I've been very heavily involved in in the last several months, is really helping customers understand where and how across their organization, across their enterprise, they can leverage big data, in particular to drive some key business initiatives. So that's kind of what I've been busy doing the last few months. What's the top pain points that you're seeing out there? Obviously, big data has evolved from, you know, cool, you got some Hadoop, you got some proof of concepts, but you know, Companies like Cloudera are growing, you got Hortonworks now in the mix, you got Data Stacks, you got Platfora, a lot of venture backed startups coming into the mix, EMCs uh, putting their toes in the waters with an appliance. Um, you're in the storage business. Big data is stored on storage devices. Those storages are changing. What are the top uh, pain points you're seeing with customers, and what are their top killer challenges? Well, so I think one of the reasons why, why EMC jumped into the water, in particular in the, in the analytics space, is because customers want to do more than just store the data, right? They want to get some value out of it. And so it's, it's, I think it was a very logical move for EMC to, in order to extend their value proposition to the customers to say, hey, we're more than just about storing data, we're about helping to get value out of that data. And so that's kind of the, you know, and, and I agree that there is the exciting, this is an exciting industry to be in right now because there is a lot of new technology coming up. There's a lot of companies who are deciding like Oracle has to jump into the water with both feet. And, the customers are going to be the beneficiaries. At the end of the day, they're going to be the beneficiaries of really understanding where and how they can use big data. So Bill, how real is this skills gap in terms of customers being able to exploit big data and, and you know, what are you guys doing there? So, the skills gap is pretty significant. And um, it's because there's a new set of tools out there and um, a new set of of disciplines required by practitioners, especially you know, the data scientists. And parlance in and process and everything else yeah, that goes with yeah. that, right? Yeah, there, there's, so let me give you an example. So I've um, been dealing with a large financial services company who has um, a, um, an army of financial advisors whose job is to you know, give advice to their customers and bottom line is to get more customers and get more done more money under management right so they're trying to provide lots of good services and they've and they have really mastered the CRM structured data space they know how to glean data out of that they know how to understand what the customers are trying to do and they use that to provide good advice to their customers really you know spot on advice well all of a sudden comes all this social media data and they say well wow how do we take advantage of this and they look at it from two different perspectives they're saying how do I learn more about my current clients so I can make more meaningful, more relevant you know, um, advice to them, uh, recommendations as far as what sort of financial instruments they should be holding, but also giving their, their, their circle of friends, who else should I be targeting who's like them, who may be a good candidate for the kind of services and capabilities I provide. And so that's the kind of stuff we're starting to see is that customers, you know, they, for a long time now, companies have been trying to use data for competitive advantage you know, trying to ask them really simple questions like, who's my most valuable customer? Well, all of a sudden, with all this social media data, you know, the most valuable customer may have one time been your, your biggest customer, most revenue, and, and then you progress and that became your most profitable customer. Well, now, I think companies are going to the next step and saying, you know, there are financial measures out there that are measure, me, better measures of how valuable a customer is to me, other than just how much revenue they generate, how much profit. For example, what's the network of friends that they've got that potentially I could go out there and recruit through? And so, the definition of who's my most valuable customer 
is changing dramatically because of the kind of data that's available and the kind of analytic power that's out there to analyze that data. So we all hear about the, the up and to the right charts. Joe Tucci was talking this morning about uh, 1.2 zettabytes, billion, trillion, trillion, billion, however you look at it. Um, and most of that is unstructured. Now here's Oracle, which I usually think of as structured data, but of course now Ellison would say, well no, we've been dealing with unstructured data forever. Forever, oh yeah. wow, so I didn't know that. So we started with that's relational, wow. then Good we went to him. object, then we went to you know, <laughs> unstructured data. Yeah, the blobs out so there, yeah. So my question is, is, is yeah, that's right. Is, <laughs> is, 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 is Oracle big data, or is Oracle a boat anchor to big data? Wow. Um, well, I, I... You can say, it's okay. It's Cute. okay, it's, yeah. it's, 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 yes, I can be honest. So, first off, on the positive side, when, whenever Oracle says they're serious about a space, I like to hear that because it just validates. Yeah. Because they're never a market leader, they're a market chaser, right? So, they're basically validating with a lot of companies that you've had a loft like, Green Plum like, Caldera like, other companies have already been known for several years now that they, there's a market out there. And so, Oracle jumping into the mix is just a validation that that market is real. And it's actually not just real for the Facebooks and Twitters and Zingas of the world, but it's real for the Procter and Gambles and the Merrill Lynches and the Wells Fargo's, the corporate customers who really spend a lot of money on trying to figure out how to get advantage of this. So it's a great validation for the marketplace for somebody who is not going to define a marketplace but is going to chase after one. Bill, we got 700 people watching us right now out there live, 708 viewers. Uh, a lot of them are in the enterprise space, some are not. Some are gamers, some are internet guys. They see all the big fancy Twitter, Facebook, you know, Groupon, Airbnb, all the stuff, the bubble stuff. Now say they see Apple, and they yep. see they see the, the new culture going on. You've old, you're old school like us, you've seen the movie, you know, mainframe, client server, business yep. intelligence, data warehousing, all those old kind of fenced in proprietary technologies. What would you say to them about this new environment? I mean, because you're, you're a renaissance man in a way that you, you get tech and you're out on the leading edge and you're talking to customers. What do you say to those young kids and the new audience out there that doesn't have the history about what's really going on? How does it impact them? Wow, um, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, so there's, there's two bits of advice. One is, is um, there, it's a new world paradigm out there. And there are technologies available out there that, that people like myself are trying to learn, like Hadoop and MapReduce and things like that, that, that the young generation needs to embrace, right? And it needs to become what SQL was for me is, is to them. But what I'd also say is, is don't, forget the lessons of the past. Um, you know, I, 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 big data is not new, right? We've, there was, I always like to tell a story about in 1988 when, you know, when, the, when the retailers went from the Nielsen bi-monthly audit data to the scanner data, it, it, it opened up a whole new realm of the kinds of questions and the kinds of applications people could build. So there is a lot of valuable lessons in the past. And so, um, you know, why do people build data warehouses, for example? Well, they don't do it because they want to. I never met a single brand manager in my life who woke up in the morning and said, oh my gosh, I need a data warehouse, <laughs> right? Never, but they wake up and they say, oh my gosh, I got competitive pressures, my pricing's out of sync, my market customers are shifting here. They've got real business problems and this, and this new data and these new tools and this new generation of, 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 of specialists out there can really help them get a handle as far as trying to answer those questions about who's my most valuable customer, who are my most important products, what are my most successful campaigns. So, this is, so right now we're in, we're in San Francisco, California, we're at siliconangle.tv, I'm John Furrier, and we're here at Bill Schmarzo, veteran, again, like I said, renaissance man. Um, Bill, we got Java One going on right now, obviously they bought Java from Sun, MySQL, like you mentioned, what SQL was to you, yep. Hadoop and these new technologies for the younger generation. There's a lot of developers trying to make sense of this new environment. What, how should they navigate the waters for them? I mean, obviously they have a lot of choices. We heard at VMworld, uh, you know, Cloud Foundry, Dave and I were just talking about that. So there's a lot of choices out there. Uh, there's also the consolidation. You mentioned the validation of Oracle, but also they're a consolidator. Right, you know, They yes. consolidate buying power. So it's the disruptive elements of startups, the young generation. What, how do you, what would you tell them to how they navigate the waters there? So the, the, the first thing is, is, you know, technology doesn't solve a meaningful business problem is a science experiment. And so, as you look at what technology can do, I mean, that's, that's what I would focus in on. I would try to understand, and I do, what, this, is, this is what I do every day, right? I try to understand what technology can do to help my clients make better decisions, to monetize their data, monetize their decisions more effectively. And whether you're a startup company who's trying to um, you know, embrace a new paradigm in the BI tool space, for example, a BI tool that maybe has more intelligence built into it, 
it's all about how you enable the business users to make better decisions. And so don't lose um, focus on the, the brass ring that's out there, which is if I can help people make better decisions, they will truly be the path to my door. Or Oracle will buy me and I'll get rich that yeah. way. <laughs> so where is EMC? So I was at uh, VMworld and I had a chance to meet uh, uh, you guys, the executives at the Executive Breakfast, and I saw Bill Cook there uh, from the Green Plum Group. Yep. I also saw, uh, saw Sanjal Patel from Isilon. And you know, my question was, so Sanjal, I said, you know, you guys are big data, not Green Plum. I mean, Green Plum, is smaller compared to Isilon. Isilon's still doing a lot of big data stuff, so is EMC confused right now on the big data equation? Oh, I mean, no, no. I know, I don't think at all. I think they understand the fact that there's a big difference between being able to house and manage data and being able to take advantage of that data to make better decisions. I actually, I really think EMC got, gets it. I think they really have the, the, the Green Plum acquisition. I mean, I wasn't around here when they made that, I actually joined after they made the acquisition. I thought it was a smart move on their part because all of a sudden, I mean, when, when, when companies think about data, storing and managing large amounts of data, whether in a, you know, a, a single setting or virtualized across an enterprise, they think EMC, they think VMware. Well, what logical place to go that's somebody to help them understand how to get value out of that, then to work with someone like EMC who already has that sort of DNA and, and, and pedigree in their organization. So I wonder, Bill, if you could explain something to me. I want to dig into a little bit, you know, share with us some of, some of you know, EMC's experience and your experience. We lived in a world of you know, referential integrity and two-phase commits and a lot of discussion on data quality, for example, and you don't hear a lot of discussion about data quality in this new emerging big data space. Explain why that is and what's different. So actually, I, I, I think the data quality discussion, the reason why you don't hear much about data quality today because most of the companies that, this is again my humble opinion, mm -hmm. most of the companies that talk about big data are companies that, are, that really, their business is around ad serving. So mm. it's the Googles, it's the Yahoo's, it's the Zynga's, right, it's the Twitter's. And a lot of it has to do with the cost of a false positive. In essence, what is the cost for me to serve you the wrong ad? Well, Nothing. zero. <laughs> yeah, it's zero, right? <laughs> and so I think what happens is that they're at the very forefront, these companies like the Googles and Facebooks and such, of understanding that the speed of decision is much more important than the accuracy decision. Probably true in fraud as well. Right? If you're in the fraud space, making fast decisions that are that you're 90 percent confident with is better than being 100 percent confident on something that takes you two to three weeks to make the decision. So I think that's the reason why you don't see a lot of discussion about data quality because for a lot of those kind of business problems, speed is more important than quality. However, if you're making pricing decisions, if you're trying to make prescription decisions, you're trying to make you know, product assortment and supply chain and procurement decisions, all of a sudden, the quality of the decision becomes a lot more important than the speed. And what we're seeing now is a much, a shift. Companies are starting to have a lot more dialogue about, well, how do I ensure that the quality of my decision, the quality of the data that I'm basing my decision on is, is solid. Maybe not 100%, but as a, as a confidence level, it's around 98, 99, 99% confidence level. What do you, what is your, uh, this is more of a EMC versus the rest of the world question. You know, obviously Hadoop is out there, you got these other approaches, Hortonworks and others. What's your, what's your angle on that? What do you tell the marketplace when they say, oh, you know, got Cloudera does this, they got, they're doing licensing revenue now and, and uh, getting a great client base, growing like crazy. Pat Gelsing was very clear to us in his multiple conversations, he wants to own the business and be in, the, in a leader. Yep, um, yep. So, you guys don't have sharp elbows, which is good. I, you know, so, you know, I initially, <laughs> we can, initially, we polish those initially up. accused you guys of being a little bit of sharp elbow, but then you guys have a competitive position. Map ours are your approach you're taking. Right. Cloudera has their approach. Could you just explain for the folks out there, what is the EMC position vis-a-vis -vis Cloudera and Hortonworks and others? <clears throat> well, I, I think that the EMC position is that, that, that Hadoop is not a spot solution. And I think you see that in how we, in our, in our Green Plum messaging, for example. We talk about you know, integration in the same environment of both SQL structured data and Hadoop for unstructured data. That we don't see Hadoop as, as a business by itself, but as a piece of a larger business. And that, and that has to do with the fact that those kind of, the SQL and the Hadoop together allow you to solve a lot of different problems you couldn't solve before. So I think our message is really about, you know, it's not just about Hadoop, it's about the bigger thing we're trying to do as far as help customers take advantage of that data from a monetization perspective. Can we learn anything from, you know, picking up on that, follow up from that, can we learn anything from the whole uh, Linux evolution? I mean, basically, the, the world left Red Hat alone to kind of do its thing. The world doesn't seem to be leaving Cloudera alone. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Um, 
I don't know what to say, to be honest with you. I think uh, it's, it's an interesting answer either. No, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have the, the answer. The not leaving Cloud Air alone, so the competitive pressure is still there, so the incubation of the, ver of the ecosystem. So there's more competitive pressure on this sector. It's still embryonic or growing. Well, well so even, right. even in the Red Hat era, there, there was competitive pressure, but just Red Hat got out so big and so fast, made some strategic partnerships with IBM um, yep. in the early days. It really helped to lock up a, a, a market position. Um, it's still the wild, wild west in the Hadoop space. So do you and think that means just a bigger pie overall, or? Oh, I, th I think what'll happen is you'll see faster innovation, uh -huh. and you'll see, eventually you'll see consolidation, right? It, it, most marketplaces end up with one or two leaders and, and three or four followers. Um, we'll eventually see that too. I don't know if that'll be 18 months or, th or three years from now, but I think you're going to see um, massive innovation in all kinds of fronts, whether it's in the capabilities of Hadoop itself or the integration of Hadoop back into you know, standard BI tools. The BI tool vendors, by the way, aren't standing on the sidelines letting this thing go uh, pass them by. So I think you're going to see a massive amount of innovation um, and it's going to be an interesting marketplace because 18 months from now, who knows who's going to be standing. Bill, I have a question for you. This is, Oracle this, be is this is a really important. Yeah, Oracle will always be standing. This is right? the most important question of, of uh, my uh, line of questioning. You have a son that plays pro baseball. That's okay? right. So one, how's he doing? Um, what do you think of the Red Sox? And two, <laughs> who do you think is going to win the Super Bowl this year in the NFL? So, um, so my son is with the Oracle organiza Orioles organization. He's, he's, he's in the minor leagues. And <laughs> Oracle. If, and if, and if you, uh, with the, I'm sorry, the Orioles. Orioles. Oh Orioles. The, dreaded, the dreaded Orioles. Yeah, who, yeah who, the dreaded who, Orioles who, who knocked the Red, the Red Sox out of, course, of the playoffs. Of course, of so, course. Um, he and his friends were feeling pretty good about the role they had to play and deciding Boiler. who was Did you see the end of that game? That they were amazing. dancing up and down like it yeah. was the World Series you know, victory. That, I mean, credit that, to them. That day of baseball with the two extra inning games yeah. and, and four teams playing for two spots down to the wire, there was there could not have been a better day of baseball yeah. in the history of baseball. That's why the Wild Cards is a great, great thing. Yeah. How about football? What do you think is going to happen with football? So the Patriots were in town here beating up on the Raiders, who have a good team this year. Uh, the Niners beat the Eagles. Vic was shocked. Um, who do you think, what's going to happen in football? What do you, who do you, oh, I, you know, I'm, I, I got I could go with the Packers. I think the yeah. Packers have a solid team. They've got to repeat. They're going to repeat. I, I think they're going to repeat. I mean, anything can happen because injuries can change, but you know, they've got a solid offense and good solid defense. They play in a division where, um, it's tough, but we're seeing like Minnesota looks very exposed and very weak. The Bears are always kind of, they show up one week, no show up the next week. So I, you know, I, I think it's a Green Bay year, but I got to tell you. World Series, World Series, who do you, who do you like, Yankees? Um, I like Philadelphia, they're, they're struggling. I like Philadelphia, I think they've got better pitching. They hit the ball better, and, they, and, you, and of course, given my background, I believe pitching in the end of the day wins. Does your, your, <laughs> does your, your son pitch? And my son's a pitcher, yeah. yeah, yeah. Lefty or righty? Uh, I'm a, he's a righty, so he curses me and he goes to bed every night. Oh, I didn't yeah. make him a lefty. He's a Pally grad, of course, Palo Alto High School. My boy is a catcher at, uh, on the varsity team. Um, so, uh, final question. This is getting back to Oracle. So took a little change of pace. I had to get the sports question in. <laughs> I know you're a big sports fan. See you on the sidelines every week. Um, if you were at Larry Ellison's staff, sitting in the front row, he made a comment in the keynote yesterday, oh, it's Mark Hurd, he's going to make the numbers. And he's the billionaire, he walks in, you know, off the boat, off his son's, uh, <laughs> you know, he said, uh, wedding, so he flew in, probably hung over. Um, <laughs> so so you're, you're on Larry's team. What do you say to him? If he says, Bill, I really need your advice. What should I do with Oracle? What do you say to him? What's your advice to Well, I would tell him to split them up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Split them up, you know. Lower just, prices. Lower prices, yeah. yes. <laughs> Break into smaller divisions. No, I mean, companies. no, Larry's a very competitive person. You are too. I mean, obviously mm -hmm. he races boats. Obviously you see his competitiveness yeah. on stage. Mm -hmm. You know, he's very much performance. He thinks he can win the game. He positions the competition mm -hmm. really well, as Dave was pointing out. So, you know, Larry's a competitive person, but he said, hey, I want Oracle to be a monster house in the future. What should I do? Well, put I, your, put, you work for Oracle in this scenario. Okay, well, so. Not so, EMC. Put, so put it on the Oracle hat. I, I, I think that, Oracle's a very scary competitor, right? And they're, they're a very scary company because they can bring to bear so many resources. Um, I think their move into analytics um, is, is a good move for them um, because it helps, at the end of the day, whether you sell ERP systems or you sell uh, database software or you're selling you know, Exadata boxes or whatever you're selling, customers at the end of the day are trying to make better decisions. They're trying to gain competitive advantage. And one of the best ways to deliver competitive advantage is through analytics. And a combination of analytics with a strong consulting force that knows how to go in and talk to a customer, speak their language, and make certain that the solution that they're putting in place really drives business value. So my advice to Larry would be double down on analytics, because I think it's a key place to go. 
and you know that's also self-serving for me because I believe analytics is the place yeah, to that's go. That's your religion. What about how are they handling Sun? Obviously, <laughs> um, it, the keynotes was all about Sun Microsystems, kind of reference to IBM, but kind of an, an implied HP kind of look at we got hardware kicking ass. Uh, they have Java One going on at the same time. We got MySQL. How should they handle that? That's an open source play and it's causing some angst in the community. What do you what do you think they should do about that? <laughs> There's a, lot, there's a lot of questions buried in there, John. I'm not sure which one is third. Java with. 1 and MySQL. Okay, well, Java 1 and MySQL is a smart move in their part. I mean, I think it's a way for them to, to, to lead a, an open movement, um, be seen as uh, good community players, while in reality not taking their thumbs off the direction of what's going on. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's, as, it's open as long as they want it to be open, and it's open kind of in their direction. So you know, it's it's a good move on their part. It's smart, and you know, and the hardware move is interesting because there's part of me that says that that Larry probably has seen enough of Apple to realize, you know, maybe Apple wasn't wrong after all. That the fact that I can integrate and optimize my software for my hardware allows me to do things differently, right? Special purpose versus general purpose, right? Right. That's and, the, that's and the. What would be wonderful for the the, the my customers I deal with is if if Oracle would go the next step in the Apple. Apple maturation, which is a go to simplicity. Because Oracle right now is anything but simple, right? All their products are hard to implement, hard to use, and I always come back to the Apple iPod, right? Yeah, there yeah. it was, one Beautiful. button, it does a, lot, it does a few things to perfection, it broke a market, it, it created a whole new market. So if there's any advice I could give to, to Larry Ellison, if he's trying to follow and map what Apple has done, what Steve Simple. and Jobs have done, go to the next step and think about simplicity of purpose. Great. All Thanks. right, Bill Schmarzo with EMC. Obviously EMC validating the big data space themselves by jumping into Hadoop. Really one of the first big, ven the first big vendor Amen. to jump into the Hadoop space where you know, it was dominated by Cloudera. Cloudera obviously a sizable lead. Uh, and then following that, a bunch of players came in, MapR, Datastax, you know, kind of the anti-Cassandra crowd. But you know what, at the end of the day, Innovations evolving, consolidation. I'm sure your your M and A team's got the short list going. So, Bill Schmarzo, thanks for sharing uh, your uh, knowledge and sports uh, trivia with us. Appreciate it. Great to see you, Take Bill. Care. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Appreciate the job. Always a pleasure.